Don't settle for anything less than you can be. Make your life a masterpiece. This is a series about how Sigmund Freud's ideas about the unconscious mind have been used by those in power to control the masses in an age of democracy. Last week's episode showed how Freud's ideas spread throughout America in the 1950s. They were promoted by his daughter Anna and by Freud's nephew Edward Bernays who invented public relations. He brought Freud's theories into the heart of advertising and marketing. A man like you, I mean, with a car like this. What they both believed was that underneath all human beings was a hidden, irrational self which needed to be controlled both for the good of individuals and the stability of society. But the Freuds were about to be toppled from power by opponents who said they were wrong about human nature. The inner self did not need to be repressed and controlled. It should be encouraged to express itself. Out of this would come a new type of strong human being and a better society. But what in fact emerged from this revolution was the very opposite. An isolated, vulnerable and above all greedy self. Far more open to manipulation by both business and politics than anything that had gone before. Those in power would now control the self not by repressing it, but by feeding its infinite desires. What goes on here is the liberation of feeling. In other words, feelings, not just memories, that have been suppressed. For example, screaming, crying, anger. You get a person who's really angry, and they're going to let it out. No! No! I could kill you! That's, I'm, a, I'm an old man, listen, I can't get all the strength into this that uh, young people would get if they have those feelings. That wasn't bad. In the 1950s, a small group of renegade psychoanalysts began a new form of therapy. They worked in small rooms in New York City and encouraged their patients to express their feelings openly. I want help. I do. I want help. It was a direct attack on the ideas of the Freudian psychoanalysts, who had become rich and powerful, teaching Americans how to control their feelings. In Freud's work, you see, they, they were afraid of the feelings. They believed that what they wanted was contained people, very proper, doing the right thing and living a proper life. That's what they wanted. But not, a, not an intense emotional life. Freud wasn't emotional himself. I mean, he's, a, he's an intellect, Freud. <laughs> I was an intellect too, I know, but I'm also more than that now. The leader of this group was a man hated by Freud and his family. He was called Wilhelm Reich. Reich lived an isolated life in a house he had built for himself in remote mountains near the Canadian border. Reich originally had been a devoted disciple of Freud's in Vienna in the 1920s. But he had challenged Freud over the fundamental basis of psychoanalysis. Freud argued that at heart, human beings were still driven by primitive animal instincts. The job of society was to repress and control these dangerous forces. Reich believed the complete opposite. The unconscious forces inside the human mind, he said, were good. It was their repression by society that distorted them. That was what made people dangerous. Reich and Freud had two fundamentally differing views about what was essential human nature. At its core, Freud saw an uncontrolled, violent, warlike, raging inferno of emotions. Reich said these things are not the way human beings are originally destined to be. They're the result of 
not permitting the original impulse to express itself. The underlying natural impulse, Reich argued, was the libido, sexual energy. If this were released, then human beings would flourish. But this idea brought him into direct conflict, not only with Sigmund Freud, but Freud's daughter Anna, who believed that the sexual forces in humans were dangerous, if not controlled. My father thought that you should liberate the libido and have freedom. And he developed the theory rather early that neurosis were due to lack of good orgasm, or any orgasm. Um, and that was, Anna Freud, you know, was a virgin. I mean, this is very important because she never had a sexual relation with a man. And here was this man preaching that the way to health was through orgasm. And here was this woman who had been analyzed by her father because she was masturbating. So here's this woman who's opposed to sexuality, really, and here's this man who, who's preaching sexual freedom. I mean, there was bound to be a, a clash, wasn't there? The conflict came to a head at a conference in 1934 in Switzerland. Anna Freud, who had by now become the acknowledged leader of the psychoanalytic movement, forced Wilhelm Reich out. She destroyed his career. She got rid of him, very definitely. And I guess part of what I'm doing is getting rid of her. <laughs> Explain. Well, I think that, that Anna Freud shouldn't get away with what she did, that it should be known. Maneuvering to get him kicked out of the International Psycholytic Association. So you're taking revenge? Uh, you might say so. <laughs> or wronging a right? No. Writing or wrong, you better cut that one out. Isn't that called a Freudian slip? Yes, it is. <laughs> Reich fled to the United States and built his home and a laboratory. His ideas became grandiose to the point of madness. He was convinced that he had discovered the source of libidinal energy. He called it orgone energy, and Reich built a giant gun, which he said could capture this energy from the atmosphere and concentrated onto clouds to produce rain. He also said that the gun could be used to destroy UFOs which threatened the future of the world. In 1956, Reich was arrested by the federal authorities for selling a device that he said used orgone energy to cure cancer. Reich was treated as a madman. He was imprisoned and all his books and papers burnt on the order of the court. A year later, Reich died in prison. To the Freudians, it seemed as if their main threat had been removed forever. But they were wrong. What the Freudians didn't realize was that their influence in American society was also about to be challenged, and in a way that would lead not only to their decline, but to the dramatic resurgence of Reich's ideas in America and throughout the capitalist world. consumer is king. His whim makes or unmakes manufacturers, wholesalers and retailers. Whoever wins his confidence wins the game. Whoever loses his confidence is lost. By the late 50s, psychoanalysis had become deeply involved in driving consumerism in America. Most advertising companies employed psychoanalysts. They had created new ways to understand consumers' motives. Above all, with the focus group in which consumers free associated their feelings about products. Out of this came new ways to market products by appealing to the hidden unconscious desires of the consumer. A dream thing, the mistress. Something intimate is going on. But in the early 60s, a new generation emerged who attacked this. They accused American business of using psychological techniques to manipulate people's feelings and turn them into ideal consumers. Advertising was manipulation. It was a way to get you to do something that didn't come out of you. It came out of somebody else. Somebody else said, 
this year you should be wearing powder pink shirts with matching powder pink buck shoes. And I said, why? That, that's not who I am. That's who somebody else is. They wanted you to be somebody who would buy their stuff. This whole feeling of being somebody else's tool. Um, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be somebody else's man. I want to be me. In the mid-60s, a protest movement began on America's campuses. One of the students' main targets was corporate America. They accused the corporations of brainwashing the American public. Consumerism was not just a way of making money, it had become the means of keeping the masses docile, while allowing the government to pursue a violent and illegal war in Vietnam. The student's mentor was a famous radical philosopher called Herbert Marcuse. Marcuse had studied psychoanalysis and was a fierce critic of the Freudians. They had, he said, helped to create a world in which people were reduced to expressing their feelings and identities through mass-produced objects. It resulted in what he called one-dimensional man, conformist and repressed. The psychoanalysts had become the corrupt agents of those who ruled America. It was uh, one of the most striking phenomena to see to what extent the ruling uh, power structure, structure could manipulate, manage and control not only the consciousness, but also the subconscious and unconscious of the uh, individuals. And this uh, took place on a psychological basis by the controls and the manipulation of the unconscious primary drives which Freud stipulated. Think about it, dear American people out there. You hear them now? You're all brainwashed, kiddies. You're all brainwashed. That's why you're here. So they're saying right now, kill the bum. Like I look at you in the living room, you know, you're saying, kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Following the logic of Marcuse's argument, the new student left set out to attack this system of social control. It was summed up in the slogan, There is a policeman inside all our heads, he must be destroyed. And that policeman was going to be destroyed by overthrowing the state and the corporations that had put him there. One group, the Weathermen, began a series of bomb attacks on companies that they said both controlled people's minds through consumer products and made the weapons being used in Vietnam. There's no way to be committed to nonviolence in the middle of the most violent society that history's ever created. I'm not committed to nonviolence in any way. We want to live a life that isn't based on materialistic values, and yet the whole system of government and the economy of America is based on profit, on personal greed and selfishness, so that in order to be human, in order to love each other and be equal with each other and not place each other in roles, we have to destroy the kind of government that keeps us from asserting our positive values of life. But the American state fought back violently. At the Democratic Convention in Chicago in 1968, the police and the National Guard were unleashed to attack thousands of demonstrators. It was the start of a phase of ruthless repression of the new left in America. It culminated in the killing of four students at Kent State University 18 months later. In the face of this, the left began to fall apart. We had met the force of the state. It was much bigger and stronger and more powerful than we realized. And at that point, what seemed to happen was that there was a, a change in tactics. Confronted by this violent repression, many in the new left began to turn to a new idea. If it was impossible to get the policeman out of one's head by overthrowing the state, instead one should find a way of getting inside one's own mind and removing the controls implanted there by the state and the corporations. Out of this would come a new self, and thus a new society. People who had been politically active were persuaded that if they could change themselves and be healthy individuals, and if a movement grew up just aimed at people changing themselves, then at some point all that positive change going on 
well, you could say quantity would become quality and there would be a sort of a spontaneous transformation of society. But, politi- but political activism was not required. It's about making a new you, that if enough people changed the way they were, that the society would change. So the personal became political? Yes, the personal became political. Without changing the personal, you didn't stand a chance of changing the political. Coming up against the state power of the United States was not an option. I mean, they outgunned us. <laughs> and to produce the new self, they turned to the ideas and techniques of Wilhelm Reich. Since his death, a small group of psychotherapists have been developing techniques based on Reich's ideas. Their aim was to invent ways that would allow individuals to free themselves from the controls implanted in their minds by society. Their center was a tiny old motel on the remote coast of California. It was called the Esalen Institute. The dominant figure at Esalen was a psychoanalyst called Fritz Perls. Perls had been trained by Reich and had developed a form of group encounter in which he pushed individuals to publicly express the feelings inside them that society had said were dangerous and should be repressed. It's a basic fear of that thing inside me, like a little demon in there. It doesn't come out very often. It's really hard to get it out. Now put the thing inside you on that chair and talk to it. The war, World War One, in which the United States participated, had absolutely no reason to be our war. We went in there, we were railroaded into it, if I can be vulgar, we were suckered into that war merely so that the Zionists of the world could obtain Palestine. Now, that is something that the people in the United States have never been told. They never knew why we went into World War I. Now what happened? After we got into the war, the Zionists went to Great Britain and they said, well, we performed our part of the agreement. Let's have something in writing that shows that you are going to keep your bargain and give us Palestine after you win the war. Because they didn't know whether the war would last another year or another ten years. So they started to work out a receipt. The receipt took the form of a letter and it was worded in very cryptic language so that the world at large wouldn't know what it was all about. And that was called the Balfour Declaration. The Balfour Declaration was merely Great Britain promised to pay the Zionists what they had agreed upon as a consideration for getting the United States into the war. So this great Balfour Declaration that you hear so much about 
is just as phony as a $3 bill, and I don't think I can make it more emphatic than that. Now, that is where all the trouble starts. The United States is in the war, the United States crushed Germany, we went in there, and it's history, you know what happened. Now, when the war was ended, and the Germans went to Paris, to the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, there were 117 Jews there as a delegation representing the Jews, headed by Bernard Baruch. I was there, I ought to know. Now what happened? The Jews at that peace conference, when they were cutting up Germany and parceling out Europe to all these nations that claimed a right to a certain part of European territory, the Jews said, how about Palestine for us? And they produced, for the first time, to the knowledge of Germans, this Balfour Declaration. So the Germans, for the first time, realized, oh, that was the game. That's why the United States came into the war. And the Germans, for the first time, realized that they were defeated. They suffered this terrific reparation that was slapped onto them because the Zionists wanted Palestine. And they were determined to get it at any cost. Now, that brings us up to another very interesting point. When the Germans realized this, they naturally resented it. Up to that time, the Jews had never been better off in any country in the world than they had been in Germany. Pearls used to call this getting on the hot seat in front of a group. This, if this were the hot seat and you were Pearls, and you would uh, guide me into this process of uh, self-enactment, self-revelation, um, of staying present to all the parts of yourself and noticing it and then taking ownership of this. As the demon? Yes. Yes, I can come out. I can come right out of him and I can push him aside. So and he you, see you. Push, I can push, push you, you aside. aside. Yeah, yeah. Be the demon with each one of us. I can make you all cry. I can make you all feel terrible, maybe even forever. I can make the mouth, this mouth here, do things and say things. I can almost destroy anyone, each one of you, if I get out. There isn't one of you that I would spare, not even you. How do you feel now? I feel better. I, I mean, I... <laughs> I feel very honest. Yeah. And you notice the increase of power. It's In other words, <laughs> taking ownership of who you are and how you act and how you feel. Your whole being in the world. In other words, giving you autonomy. Owning your freedom. I'm frightening. When I have my power, I am frightening. See, I frighten you with my power. I frighten you with my power. Now, where do you feel your power? In your hands? In your muscles? Where else? My God! <sighs> I want to do for me! God damn you! Okay, okay, okay. Stop it. F*** you. It was not phony movement. That's what I wanted to do, and I did it. What Pearls and others working at Esalen believed was that they were creating ways that allowed individuals to express their true inner selves. I want them to apply it for me. Oh. Out of this, they believed, would come new autonomous beings free of social conditioning. To the left, defeated in the wake of Chicago, it was an enormously attractive idea. These techniques could be used to unleash a new, powerful self 
strong enough to overthrow the old order. In the late 60s and early 70s, thousands flocked to Esalen. Only a few years before, it had been an obscure fringe institute. Now it became the centre of a national movement for personal transformation, the human potential movement. So it became magnetic. People wanted to join this stream of exploration. Within seven or eight years, there were about 200 of these centres in America uh, looking uh, mainly to Esalen for the leadership. I feel so liberated. Really? It's fantastic. And it took on a big political agenda. You could not separate personal transformation from social transformation. The two go together. As the movement grew, the leaders of Esalen decided to try and use their techniques to solve social problems. They began with racism. They organized an encounter group for white and black radicals. Both groups would be encouraged to express their inner racist feelings which had been instilled in them by society. By doing this, they would transcend those feelings and encounter each other as individuals. I started a series of encounters called um, Racial Confrontation as Transcendental Experience. We thought that we wanted to get that kind of black-white confrontation so you could really get down to see what was between the two races, not by backing off and trying to be polite, but by going right into the belly of the beast, of this beast of, of racial prejudice. And these were extremely dramatic. These were the toughest workshops ever convened at Esalen Institute. participate in athletics. That's what we use to divert the energy of the Gentiles while we take over the systems of power. Everyone's been manipulated by science and scientific indoctrination. You're fixed about the age of 15 for the rest of your life, that's how it seems. Till the day they die they're watching sports. They're watching international corporations that own massive sports teams where guys are paid millions of bucks each for throwing or kicking a ball around. Something children do. Something you grow out of as you grow up. You only project it through someone else. Someone else who pretends at a weekend to be your tribe and he's fighting someone else. Because in your own life you have no power at all. But there you are. Suddenly you see yourself as a warrior for the weekend. What a joke. What a joke. I think there's a resurgence of anti-Semitism because Jews are going to be at the center of that. They are now going into a multicultural mode and Jews will be resented because of our leading role, 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 because of our leading role. Today's Christian pastors have themselves surrendered to the commercial religion of multiculturalism and diversity, and they too once again murder our people daily by encouraging them to race mix and to seek after the false gods of Judaism. What these pastors out there in the mainstream are doing, it might seem innocent, it might seem innocuous, but they tell these people from their pulpits that all these foul things are acceptable, and the people believe it, and they run off and do these things, and when they give up their daughters to Negroes and all kinds of brown squat monsters, they're actually responsible for the murder of those girls and of our people. Looking at you, whitey! You got clothes oh, on! So you got shoes me, huh? on! You're just so sure looking at me, huh? You got the goddamn police in the neighborhood! Really? They're not my police. You got a governor, you got a mayor! Oh, really? You got the president! You, you got ambassadors! Too. You can vote too. You got deaths in Vietnam! That's the benefits of slave labor! 
You got buildings, skyscrapers that you dominate and control economically and politically. And tell me that it's not yours. It's yours too. Then the blacks all got together and attacked the whites. And they just let us have it. What they call it was peeping somebody. Peeping somebody means uh, peeping into their secrets, into their phoniness and so forth. Like uh, the white liberal. Oh, they really, really got onto the white liberal, you know. So don't give me no shit about I'm free. You're a goddamn liar, you white pink son of a bitch, you. Yeah, I want to know what you came down here for. You want a black buck, huh? Yeah. You looking for a stud? Huh? Well, what did you come here for? You're sitting there with your legs all gap wide open showing your drawers. Now, what'd you come here for? The black-white encounter groups were a disaster. The black radicals saw it as an insidious attempt to destroy their power. By trying to turn them into liberated individuals, Esalen was removing the one thing that gave them power and confidence in their struggle against racism, their collective identity as blacks. For my reason. For your reason. My, 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 dig this. Your reason for being here is different from my reason. By the late 60s, the idea of self-exploration was spreading rapidly in America. Encounter groups became the center of what was seen as a radical alternative culture based on the development of the self, free of a corrupt capitalist culture. We just want the freedom to, to be ourselves, and that's for love, for experience, positive way of life. We don't, we don't say uh, that you're wrong. We just want to be free to, to be what we want to be or what we find ourselves to be as we continue to search ourselves. And it was beginning to have a serious effect on corporate America because these new selves were not behaving as predictable consumers. The life insurance industry in particular was concerned that fewer and fewer college students were buying life insurance when they left university. They asked Daniel Yankalovich, America's leading market researcher, to investigate. He had studied psychoanalysis. The life insurance business, more than any other business at the time, was built on the Protestant ethic. You only bought life insurance if you were a person who sacrificed for the future. If you lived in the present, you had no need for life insurance. So they had some sense that maybe the sort of core values of the Protestant ethic were being challenged by some of these uh, new values that were beginning to appear. And I was really astonished at what I found. The conventional interpretation, the dominant interpretation, was that it had to do with political radicalism. But, you know, it was clear to us that that was a mask, a cover. The core of it had to do with self-expressiveness. That this preoccupation with the self and the inner self, that was what was so important to people. The ability to be self-expressive. Wow, what a feeling! Yankelovich began to track the growth and behavior of these new expressive selves. What he told the corporations was that these new beings were consumers, but they no longer wanted anything that would place them within the narrow strata of American society. Instead, what they wanted were products that would express their individuality, their difference in a conformist world, the very things that U.S. corporations did not make. Products have always had an emotional meaning. What was new was individuality. The idea that this product expresses me, and uh, whether it was a small European car, the particular music system, your presentation of self, your clothing, for immediate energy from our muscles and <laughs> these become ways in which people can expend their money in order to say to the world who they are but the manufacturers they had no idea of what was going on really in the uh, with consumers and in the market at large major advertising companies set up what they called operating groups to try and work out how to appeal to these new individuals. The head of one agency sent a memo to all staff. We must conform, he told them, to the new non-conformists. 
we must listen to the music of Bobby Dylan and go to the theatre more. But the problem was, few of the self-expressive individuals would take part in focus groups. The advertisers were left to their own devices. There's a new cereal that tastes so right. Uh, makes you dance, it's a way out of sight. It's tasty little squares of malted wheat. It's crispy and it's crunchy and it tastes so neat. Faster though. That's what I'm saying, it's a folk casino. rock with more rock than folk. And there was an even more serious problem. To make products for people who wanted to express themselves would mean creating variety. But the systems of mass production that had been developed in America were only profitable if they made large numbers of the same objects. This had fitted perfectly with the limited range of desires of a conformist society. The expressive self threatened this whole system of manufacture. And the threat was about to grow rapidly. Go! Because an entrepreneur had invented a way of mass producing this new independent self. He was called Werner Erhard. Some of the stuff that we traditionally think of as being in your mind is actually in the world, because you're moving to that too. Erhard had invented a system called EST, Erhard Seminar Training. Hundreds of people came for weekend sessions to be taught how to be themselves. And EST was soon copied by other groups, like Exegesis in Britain. Many of Erhard's techniques came from the human potential movement, but he criticized the movement for not having gone far enough. Their idea that there was a central core inside all human beings was, he said, just another limitation on human freedom. In reality, there was no fixed self, which meant that you could be anything that you wanted to be. The thesis of the human potential movement was that there was something really good down in there. And if you took these layers off, what you were going to wind up with was a kernel, a something that was innately self-expressive, <laughs> that was the true self, that was going to be a wonderful thing. In actuality, you found people who'd gone to the last layer and took off the last layer and found that what was left was nothing. All right, push! Move! The S sessions were intense and often brutal. The participants signed contracts agreeing not to leave and to allow the trainers to do anything they thought necessary to break down their socially constructed identities. You're going to get come on, in there. For a push. Go for a win. If I push harder than you do, I'm going to squash you. So you better push fast. Now, hard, do it. That's it. Do it. Yeah. Push. Good. 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 Again. Yes. <laughs> The real point to the S training was to go down through layer after layer after layer after layer until you got to the last layer and peeled it off where the recognition was that it's really all meaningless and empty. <laughs> Now, that's existentialism's end point. Est went a step further in that people began to recognize that it was not only meaningless and empty, but it was empty and meaningless that it was empty and meaningless. And in that, there's an enormous freedom. All the constrictions, all of the rules you've placed on yourself are gone. And what you're left with is nothing. And nothing is an extraordinarily powerful place to stand because it is only from nothing that you can create. Adam was at the riverside when Eve woke. She walked through the garden to find him, not fearful. Why should she be? 
Eve. Eve, my child. You are the serpent. And you are the loveliest thing in a perfect garden. If only you knew it. <laughs> I do know it now. You have told me. Will you pick some fruit for us? Here. Not peaches today. What then? Something rare and delicate. There, in the middle. No, not that. No? Doesn't it make your mouth water and the scent of it? We may pick of any of the fruits of the garden. Well, of course. Except those. Those we must not touch. The Lord God has forbidden us. If God forbids this or that, Eden is no better than a prison. No, we are free. Well, if God has said you are free, then be free. Pick and eat. But if we eat the fruit of that tree, we will die. You will not die. Death is a big word. You don't understand it. He asks for obedience. And would God have put the tree in the garden if it truly brought death? I cannot argue with God. Unless you taste the fruit. Why do I feel the world pulling against me? The air is thick. And from this nothing, people were able to invent a life and allowing them to create themselves. Invent themselves. Invent themselves. You can be what you want to be. I want you to start to make that sound and on that sound create and people the world the way you want to create it. What Earhart did was to say that only the individual matters that there is no societal concern, that you living a fulfilled life is all you need be concerned about. Est people came out of those trainings feeling that it wasn't selfish to think about yourself, it was your highest duty. Go kiss me and smile for me Tell me that you wait for me Hold me like you let me go. The training is, uh, is two weekends, mm -hmm. and uh, it was quite an incredible experience in my life. Uh, I'll forever be grateful for the experience. I got a great deal out of it. We really want to know who we are. There are things going on. We learn more and more about us, ourselves all the time. And to really find out what it, make, what it is that makes us tick and how we are discovering ourselves. I'm leaving. Est became hugely successful. Singers, film stars, and hundreds of thousands of ordinary Americans underwent the training in the 1970s. But in the process, the political idea that had begun the movement for personal transformation began to disappear. The original vision had been that through discovering and expressing the self, a new culture would be born, one that would challenge the power of the state. We will not let them separate our culture from our politics. We are a people. We are all together. F*** them. But what was now emerging was the idea that people could be happy simply within themselves and that changing society was irrelevant. One of the proponents of this was Jerry Rubin. In 1968, Rubin, as leader of the Yippies, had led the march on Chicago. But now he had undergone S-training. I was willing to die, and I, and I had a martyr complex in a sense, I think we all did. And I've given up that ideal of sacrifice. Um, and I, I'm not as um, 
I'm not as overwhelmingly moved by injustice as I was. And now we reincarnated ourselves from within. Basically, the politics were lost and, 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 and totally replaced by this lifestyle. And, and then the desire to become deeper and deeper into the self. By now, a grandiose sense of the self. And my uh, a good friend uh, and uh, one of the original Yippie founders, Jerry Rubin, definitely moved in that direction. And, and I think he was buying into, beginning to buy into the notion that he could be happy and fully self-developed on his own. Socialism in one person. Yes. Was he alone in that trajectory? Although that, of course, is capitalism. <laughs> that's, that's the whole joke. <laughs> I think it's funny. <laughs> I think it's funny because people spend so much of their life being bedeviled by their past and being locked into their past and being uh, limited by their past. And there's an enormous freedom from that. Yeah. Letting people create themselves. Est was only the most vivid and intense expression of an idea that was spreading rapidly through all strata of American society. Books and television programs promoted the idea that one's first duty was to be oneself. And those monitoring this shift were astonished at the speed with which the idea was spreading. In 1970, it was a small percentage of the total population, maybe 3 to 5 percent. By 1980, it had spread to the vast majority of the public, up to 80 percent. You ask the question, how do you get self-actualized? You take this day and you say, when I shave every morning, I look in that mirror, I say to myself, I really say this, I say, nobody is going to ruin this day for you, Wayne Dyer, nobody. That this preoccupation with the self and the inner self traveled and spread throughout the society in the 1970s. It helped me to stop living in the past and start building from today mm -hmm. and using my experiences in a positive way mm -hmm. to be a better person today and tomorrow. But then the problem comes, well, how do you be self-expressive? And it was at this point that American capitalism decided it was going to step in and help these new individuals to express themselves and in the process, make a lot of money. The first thing they were going to do was to find a way of getting inside their heads, to discover what these new beings wanted in order to be themselves. This came not from Madison Avenue, but from one of the most powerful scientific research institutes in America. Stanford Research Institute in California worked for corporations and government. It had done much of the early work on computers, and was also working for the Department of Defense on what would become the Star Wars project. In 1978, a group of economists and psychologists at SRI decided to find a way to read, measure, and fulfill the desires of these new unpredictable consumers. The idea was to create a rigorous tool for measuring uh, a whole range of, of, of desires, wishes, values that uh, uh, prior to that time had been kind of overlooked. They say in business, you know, what gets measured gets done. We were basically telling manufacturers, if you're really going to satisfy not just the basic needs, but individuated wants, whims, and desires of, of more highly uh, developed uh, human beings, you're going to have to segment. You're going to have to individuate. To do this, SRI turned for help to those who had begun the liberation of the self. In particular, one of the leaders of the human potential movement, a psychologist called Abraham Maslow. Through observing the work at places like Esalen, Maslow had invented a new system of psychological types. He called it the hierarchy of needs, and it described the different emotional stages that people went through as they liberated their feelings. At the top was self-actualization. This was the point at which individuals became completely self-directed and free of society. The team at SRI thought that Maslow's hierarchy might form the basis for a new way to categorize society. Not by social class, 
but by different psychological desires and drives. To test this, they designed a huge questionnaire with hundreds of questions about how people saw themselves, their inner values. The questions were designed to see whether people fitted into Maslow's categories. We were trying to find out what people really felt like, so we asked these <clears throat> really penetrating questions, and we hired a, a company that administers surveys, you know, to do them. They said they've never seen anything like it. Usually you have to send out a postcard six weeks and then another postcard, and then you got to call the people up, you know, to get the return rates up. We had an 86% return, and they only sent out one postcard. People loved filling out this questionnaire. We got several questionnaires back with a note attached saying, do you have any other questionnaires I could fill out? Because people, we were asking people to think about things that they had never thought about before, and they liked thinking about them. Like you know? what? Like what they felt inside? Yeah, like what they felt inside. What, what motivated them? What was their life about? What was important to them? It was sort of like, wow. The answers were then analyzed by computer. It revealed that there were underlying patterns in the way people felt about themselves, which fitted Maslow's categories. And at the top of the hierarchy were a large and growing group which cut across all social classes. The SRI team called them the inner directives. These were people who felt they were not defined by their place in society, but by the choices they made themselves. But what SRI discovered was that these people could be defined by the different patterns of behavior through which they chose to express themselves. Self-expression was not infinite. It fell into identifiable types. And the SRI team invented a new term for it, lifestyles. They had managed to categorize the new individualism. They called their system Values and Lifestyles, VALS for short. At the forefront of this change are three new VALS groups, groups we call inner directive. These are people for whom personal satisfaction is more important than status or money. They tend to be self-expressive, complex, and individualistic. Rob is an I am me. I am me's are searching for new values, breaking away from traditions and inventing their own standards. Rob even invented his own name, Rob Noxious. Jody is an experiential. This is a group seeking inner growth through direct experience. Experientials aren't in one place much. This is the try anything once crowd, and all that activity takes goods and services. Their hobbies are hands-on, and their possessions are simple, but not always simply priced. I'm a bookseller. I sell books. Uh, I'm a businessman. Um, that doesn't necessarily believe mean that I believe in capitalism. It just happens to be what I'm doing now. SRI created a simplified questionnaire with just 30 key questions. Anyone who answered them could be immediately fitted into a dozen or so of these new groups. It allowed businesses to identify which groups were buying their products and from that how the goods could be marketed so they became powerful emblems of those groups inner values and lifestyles. It was the beginning of lifestyle marketing. So it allowed people not just to look at people as demographics, group of age and income and whatever, but to really understand the underlying motivations. I mean, most of marketing was looking at people's actions and trying to figure out what to do. But what we were doing is we were trying to look more into people's underlying values so that we could predict what is their lifestyle, what kind of house do they live in, what kind of car do they drive. So the corporations were then able to sell things to them by understanding them, by having labels, by knowing what these people look like, where they live, what their lifestyles are. If a new product expressed a particular group's values, it would be bought by them. This is what made the values and lifestyle system so powerful, its ability to predict what new products self-actualizers would choose. And this power was about to be demonstrated dramatically. Vowels would show it could predict not just the products they would buy, but the politicians they were going to choose to elect. Ladies and gentlemen, the next president of the United States of America, Ronald Reagan! In 1980, Ronald Reagan ran for president. He and his advisers were convinced they could win on a program of a new individualism. It 
would be an attack on 50 years of government interference in people's lives. I wrote a speech about let the people make the basic decisions, get judges out of the way, get bureaucrats out of the way, get centralized government out of the way. I gave Reagan a choice of several titles for the speech, and the one he picked was let the people rule, let the people regain rule, regain control over their own destiny away from a remote elite in Washington. I would like to think that the kind of leadership that I would exercise in Washington is not the kind of leadership that I would pretend that I can solve all the problems I've been discussing here, but that together you and I can. I would like to be take the lead in taking government off the backs of the American people and turning you loose to do what I know you can do. It was radical. Moderate Republicans thought it was suicide. Jimmy Carter called it ridiculous. The press was extremely negative. But the odd thing is that it polled very well in New Hampshire, which was the first primary state, the state that we had to win. What was odd was that there seemed to be a strange mosaic of support for Reagan's policies. The traditional pollsters could see no coherent pattern across class, age or gender. But those who had designed the values and lifestyle system believed that they knew why. They were testing their system in both America and Britain. And they were convinced that both Reagan's and Mrs. Thatcher's message about individual freedom would appeal to the group at the top of their hierarchy, the inner directeds, because it fitted with the way they saw themselves. They were really concerned about being individuals, being individualistic. And so in the early stages, when we were looking at the messages that both Thatcher and then Reagan were, were putting across, we said they are using words that will really appeal to a lot of the younger people, and particularly to the people who are moving towards self-actualization. We call them the inner directed people. A lot of our colleagues said, you know, you, that's absolutely ridiculous because inner directeds are very socially aware, very socially concerned. Um, they'll never vote conservative or they'll never vote um, for the Republicans. But we said, if Thatcher and Reagan continue to appeal to them in this way, they really will. And I vision leadership in taking government off your backs and turning you loose to do what you can do so well. Thank you very much. The idea that the new self-actualizing individuals would choose a politician from the right, not the left, seemed extraordinary. But to test their prediction, the Values and Lifestyles team did a survey of voting intentions, and they correlated it with their new psychological categories. When we said in our surveys, who are you going to vote for, sure enough, it was the inner directives who said that they would vote for Thatcher and for Reagan. And they made the difference in those elections because of their, their voting for Thatcher and Reagan. And it really surprised our colleagues, even within my own organization. It really showed the power of this approach because it's very difficult to identify inner directives on the street. These people who voted for Thatcher and Reagan, these inner directives, came from any walk of life. It's really hardly correlated with social class at all. I mean, if you just go along and look at age, sex, social class, uh, you would never pick them up. But if you, if you really go along with a questionnaire that gets at their values, then you can identify them very easily. And that was new? And that was completely new, yeah. At the beginning of 1981, Ronald Reagan was inaugurated as president. But he took charge of a country that was facing economic disaster. The terrible inflation of the 1970s had destroyed much of America's traditional heavy industries. And millions were unemployed. But true to his campaign promises, Reagan told the country he would not step in to help, as all previous governments had since the war. These United States are confronted with an economic affliction of great proportions. We suffer from the longest and one of the worst sustained inflations in our national history. Idle industries have cast workers into unemployment, human misery, and personal indignity. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. But America's ailing economy was about to be rescued, not by government, 
but by the new groups that the market researchers had identified, the self-actualizing individuals. They were about to become the motor for what would be called the new economy. You can be what you want to be. So regarding V8, what do you really want? A tasty product that's good for me. What do you want that for? One technique is that we ask people the same question over and over and over again, and we say, what do you want? What do you really want? What do you want that for? And they start to talk about it, and they kind of get intimate with what's going on. What we're doing with that technique is unpeeling the onion. If you want to think of a person kind of having layers and layers and layers of protection and thoughts and behaviors and beliefs, we want to get to that center core. In the wake of the invention of values and lifestyles, a vast industry of psychological market research grew up. And the old technique of the focus group, invented by the Freudian psychoanalysts in the 50s, was used in a new and powerful way. The original aim of the focus group had been to find ways to entice people to buy a limited range of mass-produced goods. But now focus groups were used in a different way, to explore the inner feelings of lifestyle groups, and out of that, invent whole new ranges of products, which would allow those groups to express what they felt was their individuality. And the generation who had once rebelled against the conformity imposed by consumerism now embraced it because it helped them to be themselves. What capitalism managed to do that was brilliant was to actually create products that people like me would be interested in, that people like Jerry Rubin would be interested in. Capitalism developed a whole industry at developing products that evoked a larger sense of self. That, that, um, that seemed to agree with us that the self was infinite, that you could be anything you wanted to be, that, that took our philosophy and agreed with it and then created products that supposedly helped you, AIDS, that helped you be this limitless self. The product sells you a, a way of life, a way of being. The product sells you values. You, you dress this way, you live in a house like this, you, you have furniture like this, you use this computer. Do you have, do you have regular jeans? Or? Oh, Gloria Vanderbilt uh -huh. does a lot in denim, in uh -huh. silks, and in cotton. You eat in these restaurants, there are values there, hipness, coolness. This is not, I repeat, not a marketing scheme. So the notion that you could buy an identity replaced the original movement notion that you were perfectly free to create an identity. And you were perfectly free to change the world and make the world anything you wanted it to be. Well, what I wear is um, a statement. And this vast range of new desires fitted perfectly with changes in industrial production. Computers now allowed manufacturers to economically produce short runs of consumer goods. The old restrictions of mass production disappeared as did the worry that had bedeviled corporate America ever since mass production had been invented, that they would produce too many goods. With the new self, consumer desire seemed to have no limit. In the United States, the concern of companies was always that supply would outstrip demand, that we were, we were producing too much, and that there was not a market for it. You don't hear that kind of talk anymore because you've gone from a conception of a, a market of limited needs, and if you fill them, they're filled, to a market of unlimited, ever-changing needs dominated by self-expressiveness, that products and services can satisfy in an endless variety of ways, and ways that change all the time. And consequently, economies have unlimited horizons. Out of this explosion of desire came what seemed a never-ending consumer boom that regenerated the American economy. The original idea had been that the liberation of the self would create new kinds of people, free of social constraint. That radical change had happened, but while the new beings felt liberated, they had become increasingly dependent for their identity on business. Corporations had realized that it was in their interests to encourage people 
to feel that they were unique individuals and then offer them ways to express that individuality. A world in which people felt they were rebelling against conformity was not a threat to business, but its greatest opportunity. It was, in a sense, the triumph of the self. It was the triumph of a certain self-indulgence, a view that everything in the world and all moral judgment was appropriately viewed through the lens of personal satisfaction. Indeed, the ultimate ending point of that logic is that there is no society. There is only a bunch of individual people uh, making individual choices to promote their own individual well-being.